I might just make the introduction, the brief introductions, Craig, and then um, yeah, let's, let's go <laughs> and then go from there. So uh, really excited to, to have, um, uh, I, I, you know, we use the word legend a lot, but I think legend absolutely applies here. Um, Professor Wesley Vernon, um, Mr. Jeremy Walker, a, a double act, I believe, for 30 years now. That's if you know, gosh, if yeah. you know anything about forensic podiatry, if you've if you've, re- if you've re- reached for a journal, you read any article on forensic podiatry, you've seen one, if not both, of these names. So we are utterly excited about this one, um, and certainly the the correspondence I've had in the lead up suggests other people equally are too. So, um, should we get cracking with some of the questions? Uh, oh, someone's just hang on. In has just said she saw Wesley talk when she was a student over twenty years ago. Hi from New Zealand. Oh my goodness! Right. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> just wow. just to remind everyone, this this is about forensic podiatry, not about heel pain. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few comments coming in about heel pain, but private joke. Oh yeah, that's... let's keep it on forensics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. We're definitely not talking about heel pain tonight. Oh, um, we got a heel pain, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So um, we'll just start off with, with a bit of a, a bit of a history lesson, if that's okay with you guys. Right. Um, because, you know, we, I was certainly of the belief, and I, I know others are, that forensic podiatry is a fairly new specialism. Certainly we, know, we now have a, its own, it has its own stream in our, in our annual College of Podiatry Conference, for example. But I was quite surprised that when I was doing a bit of research for this to see that it's far from being new in the truest sense of the word. So uh, would you mind just giving us a bit of an idea of when, when it first came about and how it's, how it's sort of journeyed to where we are present day? Right. Um... It actually goes back a lot further than you'd think. And the um, the first paper I came across when talking about this as an idea was 1921. Um, it was an article entitled Foot and Fingerprints by um, a podiatrist called Gerard. Now, the kindest way of describing it is to say you wouldn't get it published nowadays. Uh, it was completely <laughs> off the wall. Um, what Gerard was trying to do was look at consider sequences of, of footprints as scenes of crime and be able to link those to the person who left the footprints psyche. So he'd say things like the determined person will point with their feet straight ahead. Um, the calculating and curious person will out considerably. Um, <laughs> shiftiness and hesitancy are indicated by a swaying gait. People who, um, um, people who are, uh, not need are frequently found to be cranky um, and those who lean to the right are alleged cynics and sarcastic in their mode of speech so that was the first paper so we, we, we always lean to the right when reading, <laughs> <laughs> right when reading. Um, yeah. so it, it got a bit more serious with a podiatrist called Muir um, 14 years later who um, um, considered um, it was after the event it was a case in Africa somewhere where uh, bare footprints had been present at the crime scene. The person had already been convicted, and he was saying in this um, letter that, well, this guy had double anum. It should have been possible to use that fact to suggest something about the person that left the footprints, and also to help link the footprints to that person. Um, so, and, so double anum, and I'm sure you know because yeah. I, I wasn't aware of it when I first came across. I'm sure many podiatrists aren't. It's a uh, constricting. A uh, fibrous band around the base of the fifth toe, um, usually in the Afro Caribbean population, and the band gets tighter and tighter, resulting in the fifth toe auto amputating. So you've got an absent fifth, yeah. and the perpetrator of the crime had suffered this condition, had lost his fifth toes, yeah. and the prints at the crime scene in, in I think it was in mud, wasn't it? That was yeah, cast them um, uh, had, had absent fifth toe impressions. So yeah. it was thinking that. You know, there's there's some podiatry understanding there that could have helped um, yeah. them gain some information um, about the perpetrator of the crime. So it, it wandered through the odd other bit of writing. Um, um, there was another podiatrist, Lou Lucock, um, wrote a paper. Well, it was published under four different headings over a period of ten years on identification from footwear, uh, which woke people up to the idea, and then it all really started in 1971 with um, a Canadian podiatrist, Dr. Norman Gunn, who was the first podiatrist anywhere that had been able to determine, um, got involved in casework. Um, and Norm worked oh, for years and years at 
at this. Yeah, uh, he retired in his 90s. Yeah. He um, did about 60 or 70 cases, yeah. Norm, in the uh, States and Canada. Yeah. And we were lucky enough that uh, he acted as our mentor for many years. Uh, um, we became close friends with Norm. Yeah. yeah. So after that, more podiatrists um, became aware, got involved. Um, it was Dr. John DiMaggio over in the States. He, he was a part-time police officer as well as a podiatrist. So he made connections and began to see the sort of things podiatrists could do through his, his work as a police officer. And then over in the UK, um, we came on the scene in the late 80s when is when I did the degree conversion down at Eastbourne and I wanted to um, consider whether our records could be used in identifying the dead. So that was where our work started. Mm -hmm. Case work started seriously in the mid 90s over here um, and then it developed since 2001. Um, Hayden Kelly undertook a forensic gate analysis case and then since then probably since about year 2005 we really started working on the governance side of things and that was when the whole discipline really started to take off. Wow I mean so it goes it goes back so much further than I think anyone has an appreciation of which is yeah. which is great and, and clearly it's 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 evolved over that time so present day yeah a podiatrist wants to move into the field, specialise, you know, refer to themselves as a forensic podiatrist. What's the sort of the sort of route that they have to send themselves on um, to achieve that? Right. I suppose at this point it's probably fair to say a classic mistake would be to um, just think that you're an experienced, knowledgeable podiatrist and you can just wander off and start to work in the forensic field. Um, <laughs> It's a completely different ball game uh, with a different set of rules and all sorts of pitfalls to catch you with. So um, I think it's taken as read that you'll you'll know your podiatry well, uh, you'll know it inside out, but you've then got to learn how to apply your podiatry knowledge in the forensic field. So it's all about learning how to practice as an expert witness and then how to practice in um, in the criminal justice system which is quite different than the um, um, medical legal, medical yeah, legal yeah. context. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, develop the actual case techniques, which, um, yeah. you know, the best way of going about that is to find somebody to, uh, you know, to mentor you through. Yeah, and I think, you know, your question there started off here about, you know, what, what would you have to do? Um, it would be what would be strongly recommended you did at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, any mandatory guidelines of you, you know you must have this you must have this qualification you know, like we have for surgery to use um you know an example of a similar development in podiatry there's a set path that you need to have undertaken and passed and completed the course and uh, and you eventually gain your you know your recognition and qualification there's you know a similar path spelled out and laid out of the certain things like wesley described but it's advised that you go down that path before practicing it's not mandatory as yet yeah so it's all really about learning how to practice as a podiatrist in a forensic context so yeah um the developments how how to be a forensic practitioner um in your specialty and, 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 yeah sorry we, and the learning we've had over the you know the 25 30 year period um we tried to distill down um, in a course, but because you know, what we want is the next generation of people to not spend 30 years to get to the point that we got to, to you know, to distill that down, be able to achieve that knowledge um, and skill faster. Um, that's why we, you know, we've been putting on courses and contributed to the MSc program that's currently on offer at Huddersfield University. Yeah, actually, yeah I was going to say that. Go on, Craig. Oh, sorry. Look, just on that, just in my limited understanding, I, I've I don't know whether this is the right word or not, but has the term forensic podiatry been hijacked in that? Um, I, well, sorry, just to explain it. Like, to me, forensic podiatry, you have podiatrists practicing in forensics. But, yeah, I, I think, I've, but yeah. There's, there's the use of podiatry techniques in forensics, not by podiatrists. So I think, has is, is that term been hijacked somewhat? It's, it's yeah. an interesting debate. And um, because... Yeah. Being a podiatrist 
in in many countries um, is protected. You can't call yourself a podiatrist, but then there's this grey area where um, people can be practicing the things podiatrists do, so they can say they're practicing mm. podiatry without calling themselves mm. a podiatrist. Um, there are other disciplines that do um, related things, but don't call themselves a podiatrist. So. Um, it, it, there are some yeah. grey areas that yeah. are waiting to, to me, be I, tested. I, I think mm. the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like forensic podiatry to me is a useful umbrella term to describe mm. the areas of forensic practice that a podiatrist might usefully mm. bring their knowledge to. Mm. Um, within those areas, there'd be something like, you know, forensic gait analysis, um, that to say that you must be a podiatrist to practice forensic gait analysis, I think is a step too far. Yeah. If you're saying... If you're saying you're a forensic podiatrist practicing gait analysis, um, you'd have to be a podiatrist and it's a protected term and it's closed. However, the area of practice of gait analysis isn't restricted to podiatrists and that's you know, it's an issue that's causing concern about, you know, when because gait analysis has been brought under the umbrella and the term of forensic podiatry and does that mean that you have to be a podiatrist to practice it you know it, it's causing lots of debate and uh, consternation at the moment yeah no, that, I, think, I think that was my point people have used this yeah. term forensic podiatry to refer to footprint analysis gait analysis yeah. may or may not be done by a podiatrist but they're still using that yeah. term and, uh, yeah i mean i think yeah. I, I think podiatrists can bring something um yeah. to it as a bring a podiatry point of view and yeah. you know, probably less contentious is their footprints but there's other forensic specialisms that can also usefully comment on the shape of bare footprints. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a podiatrist to do that. I think it's a multidisciplinary game. And to me, the analogy of it's very similar to looking at the acute diabetic foot. Um, there's several specialisms that look at the acute diabetic foot. Whereas if a podiatrist who worked in that area said, I'm the acute diabetic foot podiatrist, and this is acute diabetic foot podiatry, therefore everybody involved in it needs to be a podiatrist. Yeah, would, would cause problems. I think it's the same in the forensic context. Yeah, I think the important thing there is is a lot of these areas um, require uh, multidisciplinary approaches to optimise um, what people get out of that evidence. So, um, um, if you take podiatrist work on on footwear in the forensic context, we would look at the shoe and look at certain things. The forensic marks examiner would look at the shoe from a different perspective uh, a fiber analyst would mm -hmm. um, look at the shoe again from their own particular perspective and so on so the important thing is working together and rep recognizing where our practice sits where other people pr people's practice sits and, and how the interfaces fit together coming back to the, the interested podiatrist the, the, the formal step to take is obviously the MSc at Huddersfield. I'm sure you both, you know, you know were fundamental in. If, if that's not appropriate or applicable at a given time, is there a couple of journals that people can turn their head to? Um, you know, what are, what are, the, what are the, couple, the big two, three journals that, that people should be perusing if they, they want to sort of build an interest behind the scenes? There's, 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 a, whole, there's a whole number out there. Um, if people wanted to look at, at journals to to get the forensic context uh, sorted out um we would over in the uk be wanting to look at science and justice which is the uh, official journal of the chartered society of forensic sciences uh, there have been some good articles on forensic podiatry in there um over in the united states you've got the journal of forensic identification um which has had some good forensic podiatry articles uh, and also the journal of forensic sciences um, um, and then there are, you know, there are various other journals um, as well, but those are the main ones that the podiatry oh, articles oh, have appeared also, in. You know, don't want to shamelessly plug Wesley's book. Wesley's written two books now on <laughs> forensic podiatry, so both, uh, you know, both books act as a good. Uh, oh. So, <laughs> oh, right, well, it's been brought up. Well, so they, they would be, you know, somebody wanted to, go, <laughs> yeah, somebody wanted to go to one place to um, have a good in-depth read around about the development of forensic podiatry and the methods of practice etc that would be a good place to start yeah. and using the reference list there to uh, dig out because the journals Wesley's mentioned would occasionally cover forensic podiatry um, but they're 
covering general forensic practice as well, which is useful to read to, to gain an understanding of the context. Yeah. Um, but it's not a good place to go if you're wanting to, you know, just build up your knowledge as a forensic podiatrist. Mm. I'm glad Jeremy mentioned that, not me, because um, yeah, no, the, uh, the point of the book was to try and get everything at the time that a podiatrist might need to know um, in that one book. Now, that was, yeah. uh, what year did that come out? 2017. Um, yeah, the second already yeah. things I'd want to write in there to update it. Things are moving on so quickly. Yeah. But that, that would be a good starting point, but Jeremy said it first, not me. Yeah. Um, that, no, it's okay, plugs are allowed. Um, yeah. you, there, Craig, there were two left in stock there, and at the end of this show, can we go back and see if there's still two left in stock? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that was Amazon.com, so I'm not sure about uh, .uk, but we'll, we'll, I'll put up a link. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll put up a link to the yeah. UK and the um, .com, but yeah, two left in stock. If I order it by... If I want it by March the 28th, I've got 20 hours to order it. So, um, <laughs> I'm sure there'll be some second hand ones. I'm not going to have So, if you don't mind, we'll get on to what, what, uh, what many people would, would refer to as the sexy stuff. And, uh, and you be, feel free to sort of, uh, you know, mm-hmm. remind us that it's not as sexy as TV makes out. But I, I'm, I won't be alone in. in, in loving crime dramas, CSI, Criminal Minds, you know, all the crime stuff on Netflix. And it makes it look so interesting and so sort of cutting edge and so quick. And it's sort of the time from um, collection to conviction is well, one episode. Um, so I just want some real world context, if that's OK. So first of all, a, a, a day in the life of a forensic podiatrist, what, what might it look like? Wow. Well, it's a bit like how long's a piece of string, and um, the during the life of a forensic podiatrist, and um, it's often mundane, but not always. Um, a forensic case often takes uh, several weeks um, to work through and complete. But having said that, the I think the record from the uh, uh, the first contact to being in court was something like 24 hours. We, uh, we had to do a U-turn in the car, um, head over to court, uh, work throughout the night, fax the report through and drive to the courtroom to be there in time for the, uh, uh, for the hearing. Yeah. Um, but most of it takes several yeah. weeks. So typically um, we would get um, an email from either the police or lawyers um, asking for help with a case. Uh, we'd ask them to send some preliminary material in to have, um, to have a look and see if we could possibly help. Um, we'd tell them we could, we'd tell them the possible limitations of how far we could go, maybe make other recommendations. Um, eventually the case material had come in. Uh, they often bring it by hand, don't they? Yeah. Um, or we might travel somewhere um, potentially anywhere in the world, um, yeah, collect the information from from a lab. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's rare to go to you know, a crime scene itself yeah. unless you're going to, you know, for some CCTV cases, you need to go and you know, actually yeah. visualise you know, the, the landscape and the, yeah. you know, the topography to order to understand how that yeah. might have affected gate. But it's unusual to go to crime scenes and it's usual to, unusual to be involved soon after a crime because normally... The police and the investigation have used the mainstream approaches, you know, fingerprinting, DNA, etc., yeah. um, first. And it's only the absence of those or the need to have further information that they start yeah. looking at the yeah. rarely used specialist ologies, they sometimes call them, um, that are brought in later. That there needs to be consideration: have they got the budget to do that? Yeah. Um, who would they call? So it's usually many weeks after the crime um, yeah. that uh, you, you'd, you'd be sent information to look at yeah so having got hold of the material um we'd then we went want to look at it uh do an analysis of it in in some depth at that stage and then we'd have a look at the comparison material which might might mean is going to look at a suspect um in, in a in a cell or uh you know in prison in a in a lawyer's offices um and then we compare the information together write a report, send it in, mm-hmm. and wait um, to hear if we have to go to yeah. court or not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so not, not every case ends with you in court? 
No, relatively no. few, really. Um, yeah. um, I mean, sometimes we'll send in a report. It may not be what they want to hear, in which case it doesn't go any further. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll write a report and they'll they'll face the accused with it. It'll change the story. Yeah, um, yeah. And j just for clarity, that be if we're requested by the defence, yeah. um, and our report finds um, you know a, a degree of association of the individual with the crime. Um, they might not wish to use that because the defence don't have to have full disclosure. You know, they need to disclose that they've consulted a forensic expert in that area, uh, yeah. but they don't have to disclose the report. Mm -hmm. the, for the um, prosecution work, they have to fully disclose you know, all the information they have to the defence. Yeah. I mean, to, to put yeah. the, the number of times we go to court in context, I think I probably worked it out a couple of years ago, um, probably did something like 800 and something reports in, in forensics. And the number of times I went to court was between 20 and 30 occasions. So we don't mm -hmm. go to court that often. I mean, we do go to court, but not every report will, will require a court attendance, far from it. So not, not super amounts of time at the crime scene, not necessarily lots of time in court. It's, it sounds like an awful lot of analysis and report writing yeah. and... The kind of stuff that the TV shows don't don't uh, don't focus on too much. Um, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. And, and once, once the primary podiatrist, the reporting podiatrist, has done the work, we, we would always get an independent podiatrist without knowing what I'd found. Um, it might be Jeremy, it might be one of my other colleagues. They would work through the materials themselves and, in, in effect, repeat the work. Mm -hmm. And then you would compare the two draft reports together and you should be saying exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. If not, you try and work out what's gone wrong and make notes on it and declare it. And, and how many forensic podiatrists are there in the UK at present? Depends how you measure it. Mm -hmm. um, if you look on how many have undertaken the competency <clears> testing <throat> um, and have a um, valid certificate, to show that at the moment would be about five or six at the present yeah, minute in time. Yeah, single figures. Yeah. yeah. If you look at the number that are, are working regularly in the field, it's about 12. And if you look at the number of people who have some level of case experience, probably about 25. And then j just for clarity, because the term, you know, forensic practice yeah. um, covers you know, the application of our knowledge to assist the law. So that would cover the medico-legal, you know, negligence type uh, work in the civil arena. But, you know, we're, we're, you know, for this evening, probably best just to talk about the criminal context. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Actually, just, just, um, just on that, we have had a question come in about from Karen. And she asked, is there a demand in the UK for podiatry forensics? How, just how much work is available? Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of it. Yes, yeah. the um, majority of it's um, forensic gait analysis work. That, that's that's where the large volume of cases. And I think where yeah. um, I'm, I'm currently getting about um, one inquiry a week, um, and that's growing. Um, and to put that in context, when yeah. when um, when I did my first case in late in 1995, we were getting one to two inquiries a week. Not a year. A, a, sorry, yeah. a year. And um, now, as Jeremy's talking about, that's the service in Sheffield. They're getting an inquiry every every single week. Yeah. And um, for every report that goes in, uh, there's somebody on the other side usually needs to give a report as well. So, yeah. um, and then the, the um, bare footprint work, where there's a bare footprint left at a crime scene um, that hasn't got the fingerprint detail in it, because if the fingerprint details in a footprint in a crime scene, then the fingerprint experts, you know, rigid detail analysts would use that um, that piece of information and it'd be down their specialism. But when there's just the shape of a bare footprint, um, that's when a forensic podiatrist would get involved. And um, Wiz and I used to get about one or two of those cases a year. Um, and it, it, it went quieter when the forensic science service got disbanded in the UK because any bare footprint case nationally would go to a small team in the forensic science service in London who usually got in touch with us and you know, we worked on their cases with them. Um, when that disbanded and went into small, medium sized companies, um, the two people that were doing that work retired and uh, you know, the reputation of that work available dipped off, but it's just beginning to 
pick up again and um, doing that work mainly through um, Dr. Sarah Real who has a PhD looking at uh, you know the, the measurement methods and comparison of uh, bare footprints when you only have the shape of the bare footprint. The other area of work we do is when a shoe has been linked to a crime scene either by the um, shoe print in the crime scene being positively linked to a to a shoe or you know like victim's blood being found on a shoe so the shoe's been associated with a crime and then there's a need to talk about who was the wearer of the shoes um, and compare you know the, the question shoes associated with the crime to other example worn shoes from an individual and compare the two together to comment on if it's the same usual wearer. Um, we, we see about um, one or two of those cases a year at the moment as well and hopefully they're growing because again we got those through through the forensic science service and when that was disbanded that work uh, went quiet but it's just beginning to build again. On the topic of shoes it seems like a good time to crowbar in yeah. a couple of shoe related <laughs> questions if that's okay. Yeah. Um, a couple of things that, that I came across in my in my uh, my research for this which, which i I'll admit were, were completely new information to me so, and, and interesting. So I, I hope they will be to other people as well. Uh, am I right in the assumption that you can identify if a shoe has had more than one person wearing it? Um, it is possible to do that. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of other variables to consider and, um, you know, you'd really need to start considering, um, how well the shoe has fitted the possible wearer because if somebody for example has worn a shoe that's too big for them it's possible for the shoe to give the illusion that it's had two two different wearers so there's a lot of other things to consider but um, what we we would often find is if a shoe has had more than one wearer um, you would typically find two different foot impressions starting to yeah, I've got a slide uh, to sort of illustrate that if I can do the share screen thing successfully. Uh, that's it, that's the one. Mm -hmm. Share screen. Okay, mm -hmm. so I just go slide custom. Uh, current slide, there we go. Is that it? Oh, right one, there we go. Um, so this is actually a case we looked at years ago. It's in the public domain now, so we can talk about it. Um, but on the left here are two insoles from uh, the same shoe. Um, and you can see the foot impressions on the insoles having just had one wearer. And what we've got on the right um, is when we've then got a second wearer in, into these shoes, uh, who wore them for an hour and a half. Um, on this insole here, you can see how it started to pick up a second first toe impression there. Uh, look at this one. Um, Jeremy's got a word for this. I can't remember what it is. So, so, yeah, the, uh, the, all, all the lesser toes start yeah. um, overlapping with each other and it starts looking like the very hungry caterpillar. Oh, that's it, the, the very the hungry other. caterpillar. Yeah, we've got <laughs> yeah, so single so discrete toes there to obviously multiple toes uh, next to each other on, on that particular on that mm. particular slide. Um, I mean, it's... It's kind of interesting this because it, it it depends very again there's a lot of variables involved there there always is um, you know making a forensic judgment is is usually you're trying to make a scientific judgment under under real world conditions and um, um, lost my thread what I'm going to say um, oh there's a lot of variables yeah. and um, I've seen footwear that has shown a very clear impression after the shoe has only been worn for 15 minutes. At the other end of the scale, there was a, a project in the Netherlands, the Nike project, where they found in that study, the shoes had to be worn for um, at least 55 hours, and in, in some cases, um, uh, up to 140 hours, uh, before the foot impression started to manifest itself. So it, it can vary um, how quickly the impression will start to appear on the insole. In this case, it appeared after just an hour and a half of wear. Um, it was very clear and that was enough to demonstrate, um, you know, the point yeah. we were considering yeah, in that the, particular case. The images are from a further piece of work we did from looking at the insoles associated with the crime is that we got samples of the same 
type of you know exactly the same footwear from the same source and paired up wearers of um, the same sized feet for one wearer to wear the shoes for a week and another wearer to wear them for an hour and a half and to test whether you could determine there'd been uh, to wear as apparent after that uh, after that episode had completed. So the wearers, yeah. in both of, uh, in this case, they were both required a size nine yeah, shoe. Yeah, and, and the, so. the 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 one wearer impression in the bottom left hand corner, you just want to move the mouse over that way. Yeah. Um, that was the first wearer, and we tested to see whether the impression formed and that had formed after thirty minutes of wear in this particular footwear, but there were particular you know cheap poor quality um, footwear that took the foot impression very quickly, and the. Uh, project that Wes was mentioning, the, the night one, was with uh, night trainers that took many more hours before a, an impression was formed on the insole. So you, you, you know you couldn't conclude there definitely hadn't been other wearers if the other wearer hadn't worn them for a long period of time. And and what I'm finding it difficult to, to sort of uh, reconcile in, in, in my life at least, well, how many times do do people actually wear? Why are two people wearing the same shoe? That I don't think anyone wears my shoes other than me. I mean, could you illustrate, if if it's not too sensitive to it, a case where this may have um, right? This, this may have been like the key information. I'm just trying to reconcile what it what it all means. Yeah, it comes up quite a lot. The reason um, the reason people would wear, um, um, you know, a shoe would have different wear as well. Um, what, what we've seen on several occasions is that uh, uh, the people have had quite chaotic lifestyles and uh, they've lived in a squat and just woken up and grabbed the first pair of shoes uh, they could get their hands on in the morning and worn them. Some people uh, wear shoes to deliberately put people off yeah, the scent. The, the friends are still aware, so they know yeah. that... Um, um, so they might require a size 10 and borrow somebody else's shoes that are a size 8. They're um, hoping that the general information about the crime is oh, the, yeah. this, this has been committed with somebody of a mm. shoe size eight, therefore they will be excluded early doors. So, uh, and oh, I see yeah. that makes sense, yeah. yeah. And but I mean, the other thing is, I'm just just trying to find this slide on there uh, on the screen. Uh, because it's surprising just just how oh, there we go, it's surprising just how, um, um, just how often how do I go, how do I minimize this? Um, so I've lost you on the screen. Um, that's, oh yeah, this another. Uh, how do I get the image back on the screen? Are we there? Yeah, yeah. we're there. Right. Um, there's a slide here I want to uh, share, and this was um, this was a slide I'd taken. I wanted to take a picture of a shoe, um, of of the insole on a shoe, where I was fairly certain um, that the shoe had had only one wearer. Um, so let me see if I can share. Oh, current slide. Uh, yeah, we're on I just want to just want to share it first with the share thing. It, it so in order to get this, um, I thought the only way I'm going to do this is to um, is to take a picture of um, of my own shoe. So I cut my own shoe up, took a picture of this to illustrate what a what an insole looks like when it's only had one wearer. Uh, and I was halfway through the talk and I looked at this and I hang on a minute, what's this? So we can see the big toe impression, second, third, fourth, fifth. And what we have here is something that didn't make any sense at all. This appears to be another second toe impression. Um, so I was sort of aware then, well, where do I keep my shoes? Well, I keep those training shoes by the back door. Um, but I'm the only one that's worn them, but hang on a minute, uh, my son likes to go out for a smoke. I wonder, so uh, I, I came in from giving this talk and I said, can you just uh, tell me, do you put my training shoes on when you pop out for a smoke? Uh, no, Dad, no, I don't do that. Well, can you just explain what uh, uh, what this uh, little extra second toe is here? <laughs> oh, just, uh, it was me, so... Um, <laughs> so uh, Mustard. <laughs> And that's several, amazing several times you, you, you know that um there's a lot of shoes get get worn by a second wearer without uh, without us realizing it um well those are the main reasons at, at crime scenes people trying to wear somebody else's shoes to throw people off the scent or um or just nabbing somebody else's shoes that are living in the same squad no 
That is easily my favourite story ever of a, yeah. of a child being caught lying by their, oh, yeah. by their father. <laughs> easily, easily. Um, um, we have had one specific question come in. Let me just, I've just screenshotted it rather so you, we can all um, read what Sadie was asking. Yeah, this was the question that came in. Hello, Wes and Jeremy. I'm a forensic podiatrist in the UK and currently involved in a case involving footprints at a crime scene that have been treated with blue star on a carpet. The shape and position of the morphological features of the crime scene footprints are similar to the reference footprints from the sub suspect, but are much larger, especially at the heel print, yeah, both in I'll, length I'll, and width. I'll need to come in on this one because it's sounding yeah. similar to a case uh, myself and colleagues are involved in at the moment. So, uh, I, you know, I don't think we'll be able to, you know, Discuss that one. Sure. Um, I, okay. I'm but, but, I'm not but Wesley, Wesley yeah. can comment in general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, just on the basis of this, the the first thing I'd want to consider, um, and it may lead to lots of other things, <laughs> but um, I, I would want to consider whether the footprint at the crime scene is a static or a dynamic print. Um, um, because often when the reference print um, <coughs> reference prints collected might be static, um, if there's a longer print at the crime scene that's got lots of other similarities, it may be the dynamic print, i.e. a print when somebody's walking. So I'd want to assure myself that, that we were dealing with a like-for-like -like situation. Are these really both static prints or um, are they both dynamic prints or could one be static and one be dynamic? So. That's the first question I would want to uh, to address if I was looking at that particular case. Silence, so I guess we'll move on. Um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, sorry, I can't comment on that. <laughs> no, that's fine, it's fine. Yeah, coming back to... Um, that totally. Yeah. Com coming back to the, the guys that say, they're, like you said, I used a beautiful term there, Jeremy. You said they're forensically aware. You know, we... we yeah. We, we we often foolishly believe that criminals are, are stupid, and actually, that's quite quite often not the case. So they think I'm a yeah. size eight. I'm going to pick up my friend size ten because what they're yeah. thinking is the footprint. I, my shoe leaves immediately yeah. excludes me. This comes on to a question we had, which was about yeah. the suggestion you can pretty pr pretty reasonably accurately predict someone's height from their sh from from the footprint they leave behind. Is that a reasonable comment? And if if not, can you just sort of um clear that up for us yeah um, yeah um, so, mm. so there was various um papers out to do aggression to so, so they used to measure the overall length of a bare footprint and predict height from that but there was a large um degree of error in that a large confidence interval you know so they're really predicting that somebody was between five and six foot or something you know that sort of range it, it wasn't very accurate at all and I think that was from the you know, lack of understanding about how much variation there is within a footprint from the individual. And Wes discussed some of the reasons for that earlier, that you know, if you take the same individual's footprint, it's not exactly the same size each time they, they produce a footprint. It depends on the medium it's been left in, you know, the, the function they were doing whilst leaving the footprint, it, it varies. So there's a degree of variation. You know, and the person's height isn't varying as their footprint varies under those different circumstances. So there's a there's a variation there. The other thing is the, the the papers that have been done so far, mainly in anthropology, have looked at the overall length of a footprint. And um, Dr. Reel's research, one of the things that that showed was there was a, a measurement within the footprint that correlated with the subject's height more closely than the overall length of the footprint. And you know, is anybody wanting to, to? Well, I suppose that people won't know what measurements are taken, but it, it's from the rearmost part of the heel to the tip of the fifth toe, correlated to height more closely than did the mm. overall length of the footprint. Yeah. So the other thing is, if if it's a shoe print they're dealing with, yeah. it all becomes a, you yeah. know, even more vague because uh, a lot of the footwear manufacturers will make uh, one. Um, they'll stamp sole one unit. size of outsole unit out yeah. for several different sizes of their shoe. It saves money. So um, they are one size of outsole and that might cover their eights, nines and tens or, or whatever. And then another size of outsole for the, the largest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so yeah. serious research is getting that heel to fifth toe measurement to predict height 
um, to within about the uh, size of the length of a credit card. So it's you know it's narrowing it down more. But um, it, that, that they were early findings. I mean, I'm sure Sarah would want to you know use that in court to actually predict some design, but it's showing that perhaps if we started to look in depth at yeah. heel to fifth toe measurement that's more stable with height perhaps together with an understanding of how was the footprint left was the person standing walking running jumping turning etc um, and how that might uh, impact on the length as well great can we um can we talk about gait analysis a little bit if that's okay i mean uh, I don't know if I'm right in saying it and shoot me down if I'm not, but it feels like it might be the biggest portion of, of, of work you do and see. Is that uh, yeah, fair? No, it's, it's at least 90% of the uh, requests are in that area. Yeah, but that's the, you know, yeah. like, that's the one <clears throat> to two a week request for forensic gait analysis, you know, one to two requests a year of the feet in shoes or the bare footprint analysis. So mm -hmm. by far the lion's share of the work is in forensic yeah. analysis. So not, not all of those go forward. Sometimes the, footage they send to us isn't usable to determine features of gait. Um, there's, you know, there's poor quality footage. You know, we've had people just only riding a bike through a crime scene, they're asking if we can do gait analysis on it. So not, not all cases go forward because the images aren't suitable, but that is the lion's share of the work. Yeah, And it makes sense because certainly the big, even as someone not in the field, the big uh, things that I've been aware of are the, are, the, are the media things that have always been convicted on on the way he walks in CCTV. Yeah. So um, is it all his CCTV of someone moving? Uh, can you identify them from this? And then you have to, I mean, what's the logistics? I mean, do you have to watch them walk and compare it to the CCTV? How does it the majority work? The is you get what's called um, questioned footage. So it's the footage relating to a crime of an, an unknown person working. So the person is associated with the crime, but the scene, you know, sort of walking to and from a building society as it was, you know, held up with an armed robbery, etc. And then they often, if, if they've got a subject of interest, they would have what's called reference footage of that subject walking. That's often in charge suites where the person's been brought in to be uh, charged with the crime. And that's got reference, what we call reference footage of a known individual and a uh, job is to look at the question footage first in detail determine all the gate features you can see in the unknown individual then look at the reference footage determine all the gate features you can see in there compare the two together and come to a conclusion of the degree of association or international hair by day I'm only yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and those those gate features if you don't mind if it's, if it's appropriate to, to yep. dig a bit deeper are they are they things like uh, stride length and arm swing, big, big global things, um, or are they a, a little bit more sort of in depth? I mean, one of the global things you picked there, um, Ian, was the stride length. I mean, you know, that was possibly inferring that you would be measuring it. I mean, it's all a, a qualitative statement, because obviously yeah. you've got CCTV footage that's a 2D representation of a 3D event with the lens, recording systems, etc., having a play on that as well. So it, it is working through all, all the features you can pick up on yeah. how you describe the movement when somebody's walking. It's those yeah, repeatable yeah. habitual Repeat features yeah. of gait. But um, as Jeremy said, it, it's a qualitative assessment, but there are software engineers working on automated recognition systems even now. They're not there yet, but uh, one day in the yeah. future, that will take over. I don't have any doubt of it. Well, I certainly recall in the latest Mission Impossible film, I'm not sure if you've seen it, um, oh, no. when, when, when Tom Cruise is trying to get past certain levels of security, there's, there's a, a section where he, you know, he often puts on a mask yeah, to, to pretend to be someone else. He, he has to get through this, this, this sort of, it looks like a, like a big um, sort of open MRI kind of machine, but it's essentially, yeah. uh, he has to fake someone's gait. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting to hear that that is potentially yeah. not too far from the truth. Um, no, no. And no. I suppose yeah. the other important thing on this at the moment, uh, um, unless it's a closed population of a limited number of people that um, that are under consideration, um, these aren't unique features. So they're what we call class characteristics. Um, you're looking at consistency and compatibility, but at this moment in time, as podiatrists, we wouldn't uh, do any of our analyses and say, look at all this, this is unique. We'd say, look at all this, these are class features, uh, we see this, um, a number of people have these, but we think this is what it means in terms of identity. 
Yeah, and and we've just had a question in from Simon Dickinson, who uh, who's an autist, a good guy. Hi, Simon. And he says, have either of you ever been asked to review CCTV and try and diagnose patients with disability who've been caught in the act on camera committing crime? So I'm guessing if someone had a very a taxi that, gate. That would be, this is yeah. this is one of the things that I you know if I was yeah. speaking to um, you know clinicians and people from a healthcare background is the one sort of like very common pitfall people fall into is going into healthcare mode and thinking I'm here to diagnose something. <laughs> you know, to me yeah. it's as simple as you say what you see yeah. and from you know yeah. CCTV footage to confidently yeah. diagnose the cause for that to me that would be yeah. You know, getting a little bit carried away. For, for, yeah. for the philosophers out <laughs> yeah. there, uh, Gilbert Lyle wrote this uh, phenomenal piece of philosophical work, and he talked about the difference between knowing how as opposed to knowing that. And in a way, the the forensic podiatry work is all about knowing that as opposed to knowing how. So you're just commenting on what you see in in the questioned images what you see in the known images and how they compare together yeah as to what conditions causing all this that's yeah. the knowing how mm -hmm. that doesn't really come into it <clears throat> yeah. it brings to mind one case where um the person uh robbed a pinch of transit van that you know the driver had left with the keys in and running and then in his attempt to drive away unfortunately he drove over the driver who'd run back to try and stop the van driving away and, um, it was quite a nasty, obviously, but a severely fractured pelvis. And it was quite a, a nasty crime. But the, the person who pinched the van, if if you were, if I was chatting to other psychiatrists down the pub, um, you know, afterwards I say, I'm fairly sure this person had cerebral palsy. But I wouldn't, in the report, make the mistake of diagnosing. But you would be able to state in the report that you know that n neither foot made uh, the heel never made ground contact it was you know the foot was planned to flex and consistently etc etc but you wouldn't say you know this is due to cerebral palsy you just describe all the features mm -hmm. of that gait that most people would possibly recognize mm -hmm. of typical with, of, of patients suffering with their cerebral palsy so you wouldn't even go as far as saying describing the features and then saying this would be consistent with someone that, that, that possibly, you know, possibly in there but again it's, yeah. it's you know there's no need to do it's, it's yeah. saying what features okay. were there and then the um, reference footage has the same features in it and you describe them in, in the yeah 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 it yeah, makes sense and yeah going that step too far yeah, it is, it's, um, really and yeah if it does go to court that's where you might end up in a lot yeah, of because you're starting you know, as a clinician you think i've got a good inkling of what's going on here but i do further tests and get further results and make, but you know we're, we're not there to diagnose what's wrong we're there to describe what we can see mm -hmm. um, check how consistent that is with the reference footage and then comment on what that means in terms of how rare would you find somebody by chance who had all those features being consistent craig now might be a good time you know you for your yeah. um your yeah. article yeah, look, not look, your look, not your article. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I'm not. That, I'm not. I'm not that clever. Um, now, I, I, what, what I, the question I wanted to ask was: there was this article in the Boston Review a couple of years ago on forensic pseudoscience, and yes. podiatry got a spe quite specific mention. And yes, the, the comment did. here was the accountability of some subfields such as forensic podiatry can yes. be dubious with judges yeah. judges taking the place of accreditation boards um now i'm not trying to put anyone on a spot I'm, i i i don't necessarily oh. agree with this but i'm just wondering how do you respond to comments like that <laughs> well I, I along with dr mike nuremberg in the united states we, we we did write a response to this article and a number of people commented it as well so i think this was on the uh um on the next uh, edition of the boston uh, review but on um lost the section now on that particular section that you'd highlighted um where is it yeah no, it's saying about judges having to take the case um the review yeah the absence of drink. yeah i've lost i've lost it to just comment uh, on yeah, could you bring that back up like you first did okay, Craig, sure. the, okay, yeah, sure. yeah yeah there we go there you go uh, Scroll a bit. Yeah. Oh, this was this. Yeah, this was the bit here that I highlighted. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so the number of sections of the article I disagreed with and felt wasn't a fair representation of forensic science as we understand it. Um, the accountability of such things, such as forensic data, um, can be dubious. Um, yes, it can. Yes, it can. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, which is why we we worked hard on the government side of things, which was starting to get pretty much developed when this uh, article was published. So, um, you know, if somebody's been through the competency testing, they understand how um, forensic podiatry should work. Um, importantly, they recognise when um, um, they're giving an opinion based on sciences as opposed to an opinion based on experience, and they made it absolutely clear to the courts uh, as to which level uh, their opinion pitches at. There shouldn't be a problem at all. But yeah, the comment it could be dubious, but um, it doesn't have to be if people are going about it the right way. Yeah, actually, that leads into another question. Um, uh, a little bit unrelated to that, but um, and I apologise for the pronunciation. It's Marlowe's asked, are there more countries where forensic podiatry is a growing profession besides the UK and US? Well, I, I can speak briefly about Australia. We, you know, we have people yes. like yeah. Sarah Jones in Adelaide, Paul Bennett in, in Brisbane, who do a lot of what I'd call forensic podiatry. But yeah. th there's also been pockets of examples where podiatrists have given their expert opinion. Yeah. Yes. Uh, without actually sort of being forensic podiatrist. So, I mean, that's, that's happening in Australia. I presume that sort of thing is happening in, in most countries. It just seems to be more organised. You have your MSc, obviously, in the UK. So I just wonder if you can comment on any other countries. Um, South Africa, there have been cases. Uh, New Zealand, United States, Canada, mm. the UK. Uh, we've done cases in other countries, um, Belgium, mm -hmm. Holland, yeah, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, yeah. um, on continental Europe, um, Saipan. Oh, Saipan, yes. I mean yeah. that that came under the jurisdiction of the United States, but um, we did uh, give an opinion in a case uh, on Saipan as well um, a few years ago. So it, it sort of spread. It, it, it tends to be where. Podiatry is fairly well organised. Forensic podiatry is uh, is now starting. I think it's fair to say in the UK it's probably more advanced. Uh, you know, we've got the forensic regulator over here, and um, you know some very carefully defined generic standards for forensic science and practice, which. Um, uh, we tried to follow for a number of years, and we worked closely with the regulator on that. So I think governments in the UK is more advanced than yeah. also th other think places. And then the, the culture in the UK is to to have practiced in conjunction with mainstream forensic science in, in partnership yeah. and that that seems to uh, you know has boded well for the development of casework and reputation and uh, yeah you know further case involvement. Um, so rather than trying to argue that this is an area that podiatrists should get involved in and all the traditional forensic scientists uh, should move out of the area, you know, that, that approach hasn't gone down well to develop casework. Um, the partnership working seems to be more successful. There have been cases in Spain recently as well that have become aware. Yes. Of. So, yeah, but again, it a, follows where, where yeah, podiatry is established. There's a podiatrist in Barcelona that's come across following. for a few courses and, uh, well and ho hopefully what we're doing here gets the message further out as well um yeah. just Absolutely. just a just an amusing follow-up to simon's question about um identifying anyone with a disability who's committed a crime simon's come back and commented that he was asked to review a video a few years ago by the police and he said not only could i diagnose his condition he was my patient <laughs> yeah that's uh, well, this is all to yeah. do with interpretation in Within context, context yeah. and in that particular yeah. case, he, he yeah. has the context, so <laughs> yeah. he yeah. can go uh, that bit further, but yeah. That, yeah. But that interestingly throws up a whole another range of ethical dilemmas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, there, there was a, a case I dealt with, and um, I was expecting to go to court on it. At the very last minute, they didn't need me, and I was quite worried about it. It was probably the most complex case I'd ever dealt with, and I was worried about it for a number of reasons. And the day, bef day before, uh, they found they didn't need me because they had a detective on the stand who looked at this horrible footage, and they said, who are, who are these people in this footage? And he said, 
uh, and named all three and they said are you sure this is really bad footage uh, these are career criminals i know them better than i know my own family and uh, having said that they didn't need my really complicated piece of work you know, followed well, not, as, long, as long as long as you got paid for it i suppose you know <laughs> well the nhs did <laughs> Um, la, la, I've had, I actually have one last question. I know we're I'm conscious yeah. Craig's. It's about now that Craig starts looking at his watch usually. Yeah. Um, and it, but it but it sort of follows on from that, and that is that people people love the stories, they love the anecdotes, and and they love hearing about cases. So, if it's appropriate to, and if you're happy to, um, could could either of you or both of you talk about the the most sort of uh, either funny case or interesting case, the one the case that you'll always remember, the end of your career, you'll always look back and go, that was the case. Uh, that was 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 the most interesting or the most amusing. Just enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, lots of cases are memorable for various different reasons, but in this particular one, uh, and it, it was the one that we showed the shoe with multiple uh, wearers on, and the uh, the guy who was eventually convicted of this, um, he developed this habit of. Um, walking behind women he'd never even met before, stabbing them and running off. And uh, the police were trying to control, they were trying to control him with um, these ASBOs, um, his antisocial uh, Yeah, because before there was, um, there was, there was stiff um, penalties for carrying a knife and they, they arrested him many times. He usually had a knife on him, but he explained it as his interest in fishing, etc. None of the knives could be linked to any of these stabbings, but um, um, we had an ASBO that he wasn't allowed to carry a knife in a public place. Each time he breached it, they were able to put him away in prison. And each time he was in prisons, these stabbings stopped um, for a while. So he was in the Cambridge area. Um, and I think he was banned yeah. from every yeah. university, um, uh, sports club, pub, bar, anywhere where young women, women could be there socially. Yeah. And um, he did kill somebody in this particular case. And his defence was... Um, again, um, I was living in a squat this particular morning, um, a Russian person, a Russian male living in the squat with me, uh, woke up, uh, bowled on the clothes, disappeared, came back an hour and a half later. Uh, that's how the woman's blood got on my shoes. It was this Russian person who had a complicated name I can't remember and not me. And uh, the police are anxious to close that down because that gave a potential get out where beyond all reasonable doubt needed to be proved. And it was, again, one of those cases that we did the report and said, it really looks like there's only been one wearer of these particular shoes. Uh, took the report to him. Uh, he changed his story to say, OK, well, I was at the crime, which is how the blood got on my shoes, but it was still the Russian person did it. And the fact that he's changed his story once too often um, yeah, was a major contributing factor as to, his, uh, by the jury, you know, to his downfall yeah. and he was put away for a very long time and thought, do you know that was really satisfying you, you, you look at the cases neutrally uh, you don't think about what you're doing wh whichever way your work falls but in this case when it was all over we said you know um the whole country's just become a little bit safer there and um i think that's the one we'll yeah, one of the ones we'll never forget. Certainly. And, and another, yeah. just a very quick one, if people have time, was um, it was a, a strange one that they had to um, link a, a, a lady with some footwear um, because she'd been the victim of a crime, a serious sexual assault. That at first they thought was a hit and run um, traffic accident. Um, later found it was a serious sexual assault. She got severe head injuries, couldn't identify her own clothing. Um, they couldn't pick up her DNA on her clothing, and they discarded footwear but she'd got very unusual feet because um, she had a deformity caused by thalidomide where the the toes didn't form so thalidomide more typically would cause very shortened limbs but in this lady's case it had caused a shortened foot um, with just like little tiny buds for the toes um, so we're able to use reference footwear from her home and you know and I think that was the strongest evidence we found you know we found very strong evidence to suggest it was her footwear at the crime scene so that linked um you know the footwear and the clothing and the clothing had uh the perpetrator's dna on the clothing um which they were able to convict um the person that uh, attacked her on and um somebody else that you know one of the witnesses that uh, put the police onto her potential attacker um received an award of i think something like forty thousand pounds 
or here's information that led to this person's arrest. And he uh, donated his £40,000 reward to the victim. He said that she needed it. So it was it's quite an interesting story about how you know, awful some human beings had been and then uplifting in the end to hear that you know, it was a kitchen porter that gave this information. So somebody on minimum wage gets given £40,000 reward and donates it to the lady who got attacked. Because she'd mm. had life-changing injuries and we thought, well, there's some good in the world as well. Mm. Yeah. That's amazing. Thanks, guys. And there's a, actually a question came in from Graham asking if there are any cases where forensic podiatry has been pivotal in securing prosecution. I think you've just answered that question uh, while it came in. And, yeah. and, and, <coughs> and there's, yeah, there's, there's been quite a few. Really. Quite a few. Yeah. 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 And there's been some and, that have, um, that have enabled the police to have enough evidence to arrest people and take a close look at them, which has yeah. then found and, other very incriminating evidence, but without the forensic podiatry yeah. reports, yeah. It, it wouldn't have put On the other side of the arrest. coin, there have been cases where forensic podiatry has been the evidence that has got people off as well, mm -hmm. when they haven't committed mm -hmm. the crime in the first place, and work we've done was able to demonstrate that that could not possibly have related to this particular individual because. So. I'm glad you made that point, actually, because I feel like we've accidentally been framing it that you guys are just out there to catch the yeah. bad guys. And, and that's probably a good point um, to no, make, isn't it? Yeah, you need to yeah. be serving the court by seeking yeah. the truth. And yeah, um, yeah that, that's another common mistake. Whichever way it falls. You can't yeah. be a hired gun. You don't get hired by the defence to find all the reasons. And it might not be and hired by the prosecution to find all the reasons why it is. You know, both of them come straight down the middle and balance the two together. Yeah. And well, last comment from a a Angela lives 15 miles away from Cambridge and she's she's uh, thanking you guys for your, for your I'm actually <laughs> I'm not that far from Cambridge myself actually and I didn't even know I didn't even know of this yeah, case so uh, it's about yeah. 10 or 15 years ago I think there was you know late teens of young girls just walked up behind them stabbed them in the ribs mm -hmm. and luckily all the young girls he, he stabbed in that circumstance survived um, but uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately one lady down in the Cornwall area didn't yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, thanks for sharing, guys. Um, no, I think on that note, we, we've been going just over an hour. So thanks, Wesley. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, yeah, it's been, you know, I quite, quite enjoyed the hour. I think we've got a lot of positive comments. Um, unfortunately, I just, like most weeks, we don't get through everything. And also, like most weeks, a lot of people have joined just recently, so they missed the first half. So right. if, if, if you come back in 10, 15 minutes, the video will be rendered and quite playable on Facebook. It will be on YouTube. Uh, late tonight so I'd encourage anyone to go to YouTube and subscribe to our channel um, go to our Facebook page and like us so you get notice, notified of these and head to our website and sign up for our email so we, we can just keep people notified as we're doing these so thanks uh, again everyone um, thanks guys really appreciate it yeah thanks Craig and Ian it's yeah, been, if, been a pleasure if anybody's yeah. got any questions after the show you know, my, my email is jeremy.walker at nhs.net you're happy to respond lovely thanks thanks jeremy thanks guys yeah, yeah thanks, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.